Magic Mike Show. Where you hear the experts speak. The Magic Mike Show. Tune into the show every week. The Magic Mike Show. You can trust the show is the bomb because it's being brought to you by RacingDudes.com. What's up, everybody? I'm Magic. And I'm Mike. And this is the Magic Mike Show, episode 541, Mr. Summich. A nice little J.P. Sears day. Huzzah! <laughs> Good old J.P. Sears. How is he doing? I haven't looked to see how his uh, day is going so far. They won one to nothing. Whoa! Did he get a shutout, or did they pull he him? Dealt in, uh, he dealt in... He, he got taken out in the sixth. Or seventh, I'm sorry. But dealt through the opening five. So that old uh, Oakland first five with Sears on the mound keeps on keeping on. There you go, buddy. That's his first win of the season. Uh, good for him. Good old JP. And he, I know the first game of the year was a rough one for him, but um, yeah, like five, yeah, five earned runs against Cleveland in less than four full innings. But hey, that's okay. Good for him. Good to see all of you here in the chat joining us. And if you're watching on replay, wish you were here with us, but we appreciate you listening back. We are back at Keeneland. Uh, Kevin O asked, will it ever stop raining in Lexington? Looks like it's going to stop Friday afternoon. And we just need the sun to come out bright and early Sunday mor Saturday morning and dry it up enough so that we have it probably soft to good turf. I'm going to guess it's going to be actually be good turf uh, for the course that we get here. But we got a lot of turf races. And like Chris says, I, I love this sequence, Mike. I think it's a pretty tough sequence. It's interesting who your single is because I am not using that horse. So we'll uh, we'll have a little bit of fun in that race for sure. Yeah, look, this is supposed to be windy tomorrow, which is a positive for drying out the turf course. And then we've got sun that's supposed to happen all day Saturday. So I would expect that we're on the turf on Saturday. I, I think it's probably going to be good, uh, which is nice because it's uh, it's been a little bit of a merry-go-round on the dirt. I don't know if you've been watching Keelan the last two days, but... Uh, you got to go to the front and then you just got to keep going because you just don't stop right now at the front of Keeneland, which uh, is something you have to at least take into account when you're handicapping these races. However, I would say the uh, off track has been aiding that uh, that speed bias that we're currently seeing there at Keeneland. So we should not have that on Saturday for the sequence that we're talking about. However, speed was very good when it was a fast track last Saturday as well, Magic. It was good if you're going one turn. Both of the two turn races, including the bluegrass, were won by horses coming from off of it. So uh, that was at least nice to see. We had one data point going into the bluegrass to be like, the first race of the day was not won by a front end speed horse. And then the 13 dirt horse races they had after that were all sprints at one turn. And those were all won on the front end. So uh, being single to Sierra Leone in the last is really just a, a real butt clincher when you see how that trend goes. Yeah, not uh, not loving the fact that you're single to the closer. Fortunately, the speed horse was Doorknock that you were worried about, so that wasn't uh, that big of an issue. Top Connor, I guess, was one that, that could have uh, made some noise, but we talked about it on Monday. I mean, Sierra Lone looked good and uh, worked out pretty well as a closing single for you. I mean, any turf is better than CDI turf, Kevin. That's that's very much the truth there. Exactly. <laughs> well, we do have uh, three of the five pick races in the pick five are on the grass at Keeneland. Hopefully they stay that way. We've got a fun sequence. Let's jump right into it, buddy. Right is up. rearrange where i have those on the the video spot there that's not the first time like in the last month that i've done that yes i know i know, I know. as soon as they press it i'm like shoot we've only done this 541 times why in the world would you know which video to play oh boy anyways the first leg of the keeneland late pick five on saturday april 13th race seven is the grade three giants causeway stakes for 12 older phillies and mares plus one also eligible Sprinting five and a half furlongs on the turf. This is a Mike Simich special, so I'm throwing it to you first, buddy. Where'd you go on top? We are very different in this sequence because you're not using my top pick here in this field of 12. Give me the eight horse, Roses for Deborah here. Clement, first off the layoff. Irad picks up the mount. Uh, should sit what I project to be a very good trip. There's not a ton of speed in here, and this is a horse that is able to sit fairly close to the pace. She likes being in that third, fourth type spot. And you got to look at those last two races and kind of draw a line through them. Uh, the, the Parks Turf Monster, that race is always funky every single year. I thought she ran an okay uh, race there, but never really could get going down the lane. But like you look at the times for it even, they went 23 and 4, 48 and 2 in a five furlong turf sprint on a yielding turf course. Who does that? Like, we're used to seeing like 21 and change, 44 and change. That one was a uh, wildly slow early fractions there. And then you look at the Breeders' Cup sprint, uh, turf sprint. 
she didn't really have a chance. Like you go back and you watch it. She was close early, but she was in tight. She kind of got ch- checked back. Then she had to try and run on again. Uh, just draw a line through that. She was taking on the boys in there as well. Now she gets back to the ladies here. First off the layoff, I read picks up the mount. He's been very good with her as well for la- last four races. She won both of the two that he wrote her back at Saratoga. I, this field just was not wonderful. Uh, she was the closest I had to a single in this sequence. Um, decided to end up going 3D pure because I do like a price, but uh, I, I like the eight roses for Deborah quite a bit in this spot. So two reasons I'm against her. One, uh, those races that she, when she won four straight races, the the first race, Pimlico optional claimer, uh, is a nine horse field. Then she went to Belmont, five horse field. Then she went to Saratoga, five horse field. Then she stayed at Saratoga, four horse field. This is a big ass field. She's going to have to navigate a great trip from here. She got what I'm saying is she got really easy trips in those spots because she didn't have anybody to compete with. You look at who she was facing. Wakanaka, no. Bubble Rock, not that great. Trained Artemis. Eh, wouldn't, neither of us would use that horse if they were here. So I didn't, I actually downgraded what she was doing in those spots because of the lack of competition and who she was facing. Also, Christophe Clement off of a layoff like this, 11% with an 87 cent ROI. You're going to get this horse is going to get used in so many tickets. She's going to be hammered on the tote board. I want nothing to do with her in this specific spot. Next out, sure. Here, absolutely not. That's fair. Um, I, I She's not one of those I'm all that worried. First off the bench, she ran well. Um, the, the, she ran well first off the bench in the two previous times she came off a layoff, winning both those races. Now, you're right about the field sizes. However, you go back to that Pimlico race where she didn't beat a ton, but she beat nine horses in that one. Um, and it was a pretty fast pace that she was able to run them down. Again, I don't really love this field. <laughs> that was a big part of why I do <laughs> yeah. like Roses for Deborah so much is that she just needs to run her B plus race and she's the best horse in this field. And that to me is uh, makes it pretty, pretty tough to run her down. But again, like I said, I do like a couple others here. So we'll we'll take a couple shots beside her. Now, you didn't use the eight at all. So clearly the eight's not your top pick. Who do you use on yeah. top here? I'm going all the way outside. Number 12, Love Reigns. Wesley Ward getting 8-1 to one on the morning line here. Probably not going to be 8-1. to one. Uh, This horse is, uh, like a lot of Wesley Ward horses, loves Keeneland. Two for three over the course and distance. The only time she lost was the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint. Won the Limestone Stakes here last spring with Rosario aboard. That came after a similar layoff. And so far, when I was making my notes yesterday, at least, Ward was 3 for 11 to open the meet, including winning the Palisade Stakes with Fandom. That horse, a very similar lengthy layoff is what Love Reigns is facing in here. So I think, especially with the price, I love Love Reigns in this spot, the number 12. Yeah, I didn't use this horse. I have no interest in this horse. Rosario from the 12 post in a turf sprint with a horse that has no speed just screams trip trouble to me. Um, and that's what I think you're going to get with Love Reigns in this spot. I also, like, yeah, the races haven't been great. Like, I, I, there's no race I can point to here. I'm like, that wins it. So she needs to improve off of this. You mentioned she's two for two over the turf course. That's not really fair. She won in her debut going five and a half on this turf course by nine lengths against absolutely nobody. So she's really one for one. Um, and she also broke from the one post and was lone speed that day. That helped too. So like, I, I can't get completely behind her because of that. I also think it's interesting that, that, uh, Ira got off this horse long term. Rosario did ride her to a win, but she was the favorite that day going the five and a half here. I just I, this is the first time she's going to be outside the seven hole in any race. And to me, it's just it's scary with her hung out there in the 12 post of what Rosario is going to do. Because if he tries to go inside, he's going to get stopped. If he tries to go outside. It's going to be real hard to run down the horses in front of her. And so the trip is what what really makes it very hard for me to see Love Reigns getting to the winner's circle. <laughs> Chris, Magic says he's worried about trips for uh, eight roses. Well, I'm not worried about trips. That's the thing. I, I, I Roses for Deborah. I just think that her issue is that she's facing a big field. Um, it's not going to be, oh, three horses I have to beat. Congratulations. Uh, take a Rosario horse from the parking lot. Just keep her wide. That's how you stay out of trouble. Just keep her wide. She doesn't need to be forwardly placed yet. No, I understand. I went four deep here, uh, and Mike went three deep. We did agree on one horse. It's my next horse here, the number 11, Elm Drive, shipping in for old Philly D'Amato, Mike. Yeah, I'm surprised Elm Drive just getting slammed in the chat as we start here. A lot of people saying, I would never use the 11. Look, we've talked about this four. We'll talk about it again. When D'Amato ships out to the Midwest, 
you got to watch out for these horses, especially for Little Red Fe- Feather, which wants to have more of a wid- Midwest presence. I mean, we've heard that consistently from them. And now you're getting a horse here that that gets Sia's aboard that I thought it'd run pretty well, especially when you isolate the turf sprinting races, has tactical speed. So you don't you're not going to be too far back here. Uh, to me, this this horse gets a very good trip from the 11 post just because. Yeah, like the nine kissed by fire probably wants to go. We'll talk about the seven here in a second. The five has some speed. Doesn't the 11 just sit like right behind the top three and just trip out in this spot and get first run on the leaders? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And with Sai as a board, you can expect that she's going to have a really uh, intelligent trip. He's not going to put her into trouble. And going back to what you said about Phil D'Amato, I looked for the last five years, he's won 25% on Keeneland turf. Last five years, Al, Phil D'Amato, 25% winner on the Keeneland turf. That includes four stakes wins, and one of those was a grade one. So he's not just shipping donkeys over to Keeneland. He's bringing good, high-quality stakes horses to win on this turf course. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and Nick mentions five and a half is too short for the 11. I kind of equate the six and a half down the hill to the five and a half type race when you look at Santa Anita just because of how those those races run. Um, and she has been able to be on the lead and be able to win a couple of those down the hill races at Santa Anita. So for me, the distance here, not really a concern. I, I think like I actually think five and a half probably gonna be pretty good for her, um, mm-hmm. considering the type of trip that I think she's going to be able to get here. So distance, not really an issue for me here. Um, so the, the, the 11, I thought was one of those where I just because it's Diamato and I think the horse does have the same talent as the majority of the field it's really hard for me to leave off because when we talked about this last year you just gave the stat 25 percent shipping in the midwest like when he ships horses they're live they they are every time they go to keeneland and uh this again like i said when i was talking about roses for deborah not exactly the world's best field for a, a turf sprint that we see <laughs> at keeneland so it's not going to take too much of that um I also don't think she gets the early lead. I I think she sits behind some horses and Saez is a little more patient with her versus just going right to it. And she has been able to, again, close in some of those six and a half furlong races down the hill. So uh, we'll see what uh, what she's able to do. But That's when we're both using my third horse, is a bomb of a price here. And I don't think it'll shock anybody who's listened to this consistently or we've heard (laughs) us talk about this. I'm going to go with Cherie DeVoe and Brian Hernandez Jr. here on the seven Port Townsend 20 to one in this spot. Uh, look, this is a horse which has tactical speed, showed last time, can win at five and a half at fairgrounds, was able to do it over a good turf, which we're expecting to see. That was a nice start for the first one in the four-year-old campaign. Now takes a step forward. Uh, this is just a spot where like when, when Hernandez rides for, for DeVoe, when she has specific riders, you have to pay more attention to the horses. And Hernandez has become one of those. They've teamed up 29 or 69 times, 23% win percentage, nice. $2.20 ROI. She's 24% in turf sprints, a $2.19 ROI. She's not sending these horses out to lose. And they generally run very well. If you think this is going to be attractive, favors toward the speed, it feels like Port Townsend is the, the speed that can stalk. And that's the one thing that I like about Port Townsend is the other speed needs to go. Port Townsend can be the speed that stalks. I think that makes a difference on Saturday. Yeah, the, both the last race for Port Townsend and Elm Drive, they did take back by a couple lengths. And uh, Elm Drive just missed by a head, but was right there. And, excuse me, Port Townsend got the win by a half length. I, I didn't use Port Townsend because I need to see a little bit more out of her here. It, it is a little dangerous, I think, leaving Street of off. She's 24% with positive ROI and turf sprints as well. Um, I think this is a very talented filly. I think I would look for her to win somewhere like Pimlico. But I think that she'll definitely outrun those 20 to 1 odds um on here that's that's why we're here so much making a solid case for 20 to 1 that keelan means we're getting what five to one <laughs> i think we actually get every I, i'm gonna say we're gonna get between 15 and 18 to 1 on port townsend i don't think she takes yeah. a ton of money because they're like look love reigns is gonna take money elm drive is gonna take money um roses for deborah obviously going to take some money in this spot as well then you've got a horse like Kissed by Fire, who's coming in from California, that probably takes a little bit of money. I think Play the Music on the inside takes a little bit of money. I could make a case for Bling in the two hole as well. So this is uh, the competitive or competition runs deep in this spot. I think that will favor the price on the seven. Yeah, there's no superstar that's like, oh, three to one on the morning line that you know is going to be three to five when they go off. There's not like no Caravelle anymore in this uh, division right now. So uh i got two left i'll go to the rail horse play the music for mark cassie jose ortiz this horse has won two straight including a sprint stakes on the turf at tampa last out one by two and a half lengths saved ground tipped out at the top of the stretch absolutely blew the doors off him and now wasn't beating great horses in that spot but uh the way she did it how professional she looked really caught my eye when i watched the replay so 
I'm going to roll with play the music, and then I'm going for my own bomb. What if BG Warrior breaks sharp from the five post and just instantly gets the jump on everybody? She might be too hard to catch. So I'm going to throw her on at 12 to 1 as a bomb shot, just thinking she might get out there early. And like JD Fox was saying here, that he always expects fresh Keeneland turf to be speed biased based on history. Uh, We'll see what happens, but uh, those last two races, she had Albin Jimenez aboard. Those are the two times Jimenez rode in the last year. Both of those wins, and so uh, I think this five and a half furlong is great for her. Anything lower than five and a half, I don't think I'd play her here, but this seems to be just about right to use her speed. Yeah, Gisargo gate to wire uh, at, at Kentucky Downs last year in September. That was a nice win. They thought enough of it to jump her into the grade three, a dirt race, which, okay. Uh, but then go back to the grade two Franklin right after that, where, you know, she makes the lead, but it's a very pressured lead uh, going 21 flat. That's never going to be a good thing when you're going that nope. fast and there's pressure. So, uh, <laughs> and kind when of Caravelle's in the race. <laughs> yeah, and Caravelle's in there, like much better field than what we saw today. So, I like 15 to one flyer, don't hate it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we, we definitely agree on the 11 Elm drive. I figured we probably would, but, uh, a, a fun race. I think there's a uh, several horses you could have made a case for. And I saw some other people, uh, yep. making that case for him as well. We didn't talk about bling. I, I think bling for Victoria Oliver, the two horse is relevant as well. If, if this horse wasn't first off the layoff, they would have made my, she would have made my ticket. But the fact that Oliver, not great first off the layoff, a better, you know, kind of races her horses into form. Um, it, it generally is a, it would be a tip of the hand. But like, again, this is another trainer that doesn't overplace in stakes. She's only placed 27 horses in stakes races. She's a 7% uh, win percentage. So not wonderful. But when she does step up, she, she usually has them ready to go. And if you look at the grade three races, this horse is running uh, second, third, third so kind of fits this level the question is we're going to be able to come fresh off the bench and does have a win over a good keeneland track at five and a half furlongs as well so like bling for me was the horse that just missed the ticket and the main reason uh was the layoff yep i couldn't agree more i i definitely liked her i just thought not not first off not for vicky oliver it just and she's two for 40 in the last two years that's that just not a good stat to use in the, in the spot like this uh we also neither of us used the four over of i to me i think she's kind of starting to go over the hill i think we saw the best from uvra last year last spring and summer and she's just she got the win over the at keeneland going a mile and and she's a you know a really tough turf sprinter at fairgrounds but this past winter at fairgrounds mike to me just kind of showed she's not quite the same uber she used to be yeah i also hate it when trainers start trying to find a place for a horse that's been very successful doing something mm. and Uvra was very successful turf sprinting and all of a sudden we're going a mile on the dirt a mile on the turf we're going a mile like we're just flying all over the place that's not just turf sprinting that tells you that that horse has lost a step doing that one thing and that we're trying to find something else that horse can do at an elite level and, and if you look at the last races a mile and a 16th on the turf and five and a half furlongs on the turf scratched off five and a half furlongs on the turf then a mile on the dirt a mile on the turf six and a half on the turf like <laughs> we're just not focused on the five five and a half which is really what this horse was dominant doing that to me makes it a little difficult to get behind the horse second leg of the late pick five at keeneland on saturday april 13th race eight. Oh boy what a boulevard of broken dreams this mess is n3x optional claimer eight older males routing a mile and a 16th on the dirt remember when they go one mile and a 16th on the dirt at Keeneland, the 16th pole is the finish line, so a bit of a shorter stretch run. That's important for this race and the penultimate leg. But first, where'd you go on top in this mess? Oh, I went with the, the rail horse here, which is not the one. It's the two. <laughs> <Trent> Peck, <laughs> who, uh, like, this is another one where, like, I don't love what Paulo Lobo did with this horse last time out, putting it onto synthetic, but I kind of understand why you do that. You're looking for a nice stake spot. Now we're dropping back into N3X Lounge Company, which... Probably not really that much of a drop, um, but we saw two back ran into uh, Tumba Rumbo, who's turned out to be a pretty good horse here through the spring. And we mentioned the speed bias that we've seen specifically at a mile and a 16th with any saturation on the track speeds mattered and you've got the two horse here who gets the inside draw you get luis saez this is your fastest horse in the field i don't see how the two horse doesn't win the race to the turn and if that's the case i want to have the speed in a race like this where it's a bunch of horses that have shown talent but aren't really that good um and so i'll take three to one on transect on top same top pick for me every reason you mentioned and this horse gets Lasix back. This horse is three for three in the yep. lifetime with Lasix. You mentioned Turfway Park trying the synthetic. Started the career on synthetic sprinting. Won both of those starts. Um, one on the pace and one from off the pace as well. Also, I know this from Mark Cassie. When horses come back from a long layoff, which this horse hadn't been seen in six months, 
just to kind of ease them back in a little bit better, a little bit softer ground, the synthetic over the dirt. So they'll do that with their, their dirt horses sometimes. Maybe that's a blessing in disguise that the horse didn't do like any running. Also, I mean, never got to the front end. The two times this horse has been badly beaten, never got to the front. Shouldn't be an issue on the rail with Saya's aboard. But yes, I, I think that maybe that's what's keeping us from getting an even shorter price. So I'm with you on the two transect uh, as the top pick. I went four deep in here and I used both of the horses you did. So I'll save your other one for, for you to talk about. I'm going to go with the number four Brigadier General in second. Ten to one morning line here. Two for two at Keeneland. Both times, excuse me, both times with Tyler Gaffley on the board, uh, including breaking his maiden at this distance. Super inconsistent horse, right? It's a Dallas Stewart horse. They're super inconsistent. But when he's on his game, this horse is... So I'm taking a chance at 10 to 1 that the Brigadier General that runs really well shows up. And if he doesn't, well, he was 10 to 1 and I've got three other horses as a saver. Yeah, I don't hate this one. This was my my fourth or third horse in. So if I had gone three deep, I would have used Brigadier General. Um, Kevin O bringing it up as well. Uh, one in the slop in October, two for two over the Keeneland track. So clearly likes likes the racetrack as well. Um, and cashed a monster pick six too with this horse. Like that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the trip I think is a little interesting. I mean, we mentioned we think the two is going to go. There is other speed in here. I mean, it's it's not like the one, the three, the four are are don't possess any speed either. So it'll be interesting to see what type of trip uh, Brigadier General gets here. I would assume it's going to be kind of a stalking trip. And that this is the reason why I ended up leaving the horse off. That's not generally his best trip. If he has to sit, let's say, on the inside behind two or three horses in front of him, uh, I don't love how he's going to be able to go. So you assume that Gaffion is yeah. going to have this one like three wide on the first turn, pressing the pace. And that to me also is uh, not exactly the best uh, version of Brigadier General that you're looking for. So that's why I ended up leaving him off the ticket. Makes perfect sense. Talk to me about the uh, morning line favorite here, the seven horse classic catch two to one. Yeah, the the seven is going to be the other horse I use. And it's not not overly creative. It's one of the reasons I'm going too deep in this spot. Uh, the pace sets up well for this. I just I mentioned the speed that I do expect from the inside. If speed's not holding that well, if you're looking for someone to come off the pace, classic catch should be able to do just that. We've seen him win at a mile and an eighth distance. Uh, so we know that the distance here at the mile and 16th not going to be an issue for him. The question is how close is he going to be to the pace? Uh, I think he's going to do pretty well here. We got workouts that are pretty strong going back all the way to May 2nd. You get Ired Ortiz up. Uh, for Todd Pletcher. It's a debut as a four-year-old. It's a really logical spot to debut the horse as well if you want to step up into stakes company later. And uh, like of all the horses that we've got in this race that kind of have that back pedigree, he's the one who I actually think is good and could take a step forward off this race as well. So for me, it was just the two and the seven. Yeah, I use the seven as a kind of a defensive play here. I think is is absolutely the best closer in the field. I think there's two good closers here, and this is the better of the two. Uh, if there's a pace collapse, if something wacky happens, like I just mentioned at the top of the show, if, uh, if the dirt ends up playing strong to speed for one turn, but the two turn horses have a chance, classic catch is going to come running. And you know, I read a board. Um, is because it's hard for me to really point at, at many races on his page and say, that's why he wins. Or that's why like, the Saratoga win was you know against off turf horses. But um, you know he's going to come running and, and the workouts say that he's uh, looking pretty sharp. I also use the five haze strike in here. This is another defensive use in case of a pace collapse. This feels like the kind of race a McPeak horse like Hay Strike would win. Yeah, this is not a good field. Their allowance horses M3. There's these are just not good horses, really. Like, sorry if you like any of these horses personally, they're not very good. And this is kind of that spot where I'm like, all right, I'll get McPeak at a price with Ryan Hernandez Jr. riding. Almost won at Fairgrounds going two turns last out. Uh, it was against off turf forces, but also has wins on the page. One at mile 16th in a stakes race at Laurel Park is getting a Lasix again, which I like. The horse is almost three for four lifetime with the Lasix. So I'm going to go with him in here, but uh, I, I totally understand. By the way, it's an eight horse field, eight horse oh. field, seven, seven entries, seven betting entries. I'm correcting him there. Um, but it is interesting, too. So I had a note on here to check this morning. Hay Strike and Giant Turd, I mean, Giant Game. We're both cross-centered in a turf race today at Keeneland. Obviously, they were off the turf. I don't know why Giant Game and Haystrike didn't run. Because when I saw the conditions, I thought for sure, okay, both of those horses are going to run, and they weren't. I don't know if there was an issue with that. It's some sort of weird rule that happened. Do you have any insight, Mike? No, I don't. I was surprised it didn't run either. I actually had to double check to make sure the race didn't stay. Like it wasn't the one race that was on the turf from today. Because I was surprised when you saw those those MTOs scratch off. Uh, 
yeah, I don't I don't have any other further insight on it. Hate Strike was my fourth horse. So if I went four deep here, I was two seven four five. So I, I don't disagree with the idea behind it. And I agree. Hate Strike to me is the most logical uh, pick up the pieces horse after classic catch and the price at eight to one is not bad. Um, I, I simply took a, a slightly different strategy than you. I went with the horse I thought was the best speed and the best closer. And then you added in the second best speed and the second best closer to kind of cover <laughs> it there. Uh, I don't hate the idea of you hitting the all button here. You are, we will be a little expensive if you hit the all button, but, uh, when you're going that deep, I, I kind of don't hate the idea of going all, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think, don't think your ticket would have been very affordable had you done it. Well, I almost had two. I have one single. I almost had two singles and did hit the all button here. So that's because I, I saw this. I saved this race for last and looked at it and went, can I hit the all button? This is no, none of these horses are good. And that's usually when something funky happens. But <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Speaking of singles, let's move on. The third leg of the late pick five at Keeneland on Saturday, April 13th. Race nine is the grade one Jenny Wiley stakes field of 10 older Phillies and Maris going a mile on the 16th on the turf. Where'd you go on top? Ooh, I'm watching the Keeneland race. I need this nine to hold on. Hold on, nine. Hold on think, with this nine. I think we're home. All right, we're home. Let's see here. Okay, good. Is, yeah, just try to salvage the day a little bit. Just hit the late pick four for 400 bucks or so. so that, hey, uh, that's not yeah, bad. Yeah, gets us back to even for the day. So we'll take it. There you go. Uh, the, uh, what race are we talking about? Oh, yeah, the race where you made a terrible pick. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> So <laughs> we'll get there in a second. Uh, I, I'm going to go to uh, Diddy on top here. Like this is a horse where I, I was kind of in and out and in and out going back and forth on her. She, she's been just kind of phenomenal, just very consistent. The mile of 16th distance. She loves it. She's four for four over this distance. She's able to have uh, she won on the, on the lead last time, or I guess sort of on the lead. She was first or second in every call. She's won coming off the pace. She's won stalking the pace at a mile of 16. She's been able to do it in a, a variety of fashions. And, I'm not so sure how much speed there's going to be. So I think Didia gets a very nice trip being able to kind of sit right behind the leading pack. My biggest concern, and this is the thing, I don't want the horse to be too wide chasing the lead in the first turn. I want her to be able to tuck in, get the rail, be in like third place. Uh, we'll see where it, how it kind of it, it falls out. And like I, there's a lot of surge capacity talk. And I, I want to talk about the pace in this race with you because I thought the pace was really difficult to decipher. It It feels like the one walkathon should get the lead, right? Should get the mm -hmm. lead. Yeah. There's four Chad Browns. If I've learned nothing over the last year, <laughs> one always goes. And it's not yep. Fluffy Socks, right? Nope. It's not Gina Romanica. Nope. It's probably not Butte Cash. Yeah. It's probably surge capacity, right? Like, yeah. So all of a sudden, surge capacity becomes really difficult for me because, oh, by the way, it's Rosario, which is the least jo the jockey I want the least to be able to go. Like, I, So the, the pace to me is really muddled here because I'm not sure how it plays out. But you always feel like a brown goes when there's four of them. He tells one of the jockeys to go and you kind of have to guess which. To me, it's surge capacity would be my guess, but I'm not positive. What do you think? Yeah, I, I'm with you. I think it's walkathon with surge capacity. I mean, if you go back to her debut at Monmouth Park, Sammy Camacho center, and she br briefly dueled up front, but was on the front end the entire way and and showed the way. The other horses, it's funny. You look two back for fluffy socks, like or sorry, last out for fluffy socks, and Irad had her very close because she broke from the rail. Gina Romantic has been very close, but through all of this, I yeah, I'm with you. I think it's going to be surge capacity. It's God, doesn't it drive you nuts that he's got at least Chad Brown's got four horses with four different owners this time? It's not like two Claraviches, and you're like, you know, one is absolutely setting up for the other one. It's just the one Claravich in that search capacity. Yeah, I mean, it's but you know, it's going, you know, search capacity, right? You got to think search capacity is going. Uh, it makes it hard to know what to do with search capacity because I don't love this horse. Um, yeah. and I, I ended up not using search capacity, it would have been the fourth in for me, but I it, to me, that's the one I'm, I'm the most scared about here. Well, you want to make a pick? Or you talked about how you don't like surge capacity. <laughs> I already said I took Diddy on top. Oh, you, I'm sorry. You did take Diddy. I forgot about that. We got talking don't about worry. surge capacity. I, I got the real attention. Uh, listen, Diddy is, Diddy is my girl, right? I loved her in the Pegasus. But the problem is this field is so much tougher than what she beat in the Pegasus Philly Mary Turf, which is funny because it's the Pegasus Philly Mary Turf. But this is more like the Breeders' Cup Philly Mary Turf field than what she's faced in the past. I, I love <laughs> Diddy normally. Is Diddy it? is going to have to run an absolute career best to beat these horses, and I don't think she's got it in her to do it in this spot. Um, I, again, I love her, and it hurt me to not put her on here. But, yeah, I'm singling the six, Gina Romantica, the actual 
best horse in the Chad Brown barn from the turf side. Uh, two back, one at Keeneland and the grade one first lady. You also look back the year prior to that. She won the grade one QE2 Cup at Keeneland. So she's two for two in grade one races at Keeneland. And last out in the Breeders' Cup Miles, she showed that the first lady, when she was, you know, 11 to one, 11 and a half to one, because in Italian, the core specialist was one to five. I'm still mad that she didn't get the job done that day. Gina Romantica came back at the Breeders' Cup Mile and ran fourth, beaten the length by Master of the Seas, who's going to be one to five if they run the Maker's Mark Mile on turf tomorrow. Maj, who was the best three year old in, uh, turf horse in the country or in the world and uh well until after that race then she wasn't any good but then casa creed was third she was half a length within casa creed and you absolutely would be using casa creed in this race if it was you know open to horses of his nature <laughs> and not just no. restricted to the females but uh listen i i know you're gonna say look she was 11 to 1 two back she was 7 to 1 last out i don't care i, I don't think she's gonna get overly bet she's got tyler gaffley on a board I think she is the best horse in here. So I am going to go with Gina Romantica. Okay. Here's the problem. First off, I wouldn't take Casa Creed in here because we're going a mile on 16th. We're not going a mile. And that's a big problem <laughs> for true. Gina Romantica too. Gina Romantica is 0 for 1 at a mile on 16th on the turf. I realize she's got to win at a mile and an eighth. And you're about to bring up the QE2 Cup where she beat McCulloch. Guess I already what? brought that's... it up. I don't need to bring it up again. I already brought it up. Well, I'm now I'm now bringing up the distance thing. So that was your obvious point back there. But McCulloch doesn't want a mile and eighth. She wants a mile and a half. So that wasn't her best distance either. That was only a six-horse field that she beat that day. I think the mile is a big problem for Gina Romanica. I think this is a race that is a step forward. I think she's awfully talented. But I don't think a mile and 16th is what she wants to do. I think she wants to go a mile. I think this is going to be a little too long for her. And oh, by the way, Magic, this is a horse that likes to run into form. She's had her worst race in the form cycle, the first race of all three form cycles. She's gotten better the more races that she has run. This is her first race off a layoff. She's going to get bet down from three to one. She's going to go off at seven to five, six to five, something like that in this race. I have no interest taking her, who I think is going to get bet down, first off a form cycle, where Brown's got four, where we're playing, we're running a mile 16th, not a mile. I, there's there's enough things here for me to be like, nope, I'm good. I don't need Gina Romanica in my life this weekend. I, I'm not saying she's not going to be a very good horse. I'm not saying she's not a great miler. I'm saying I don't want her on Saturday because of what she is doing on Saturday, going the mile and 16th first off the layoff. To me, those are two pretty big knocks on a horse that I think is going to go off as a pretty heavy favorite. And I have no clue how you think Didia needs to run a career best to beat this field. If you take out Gina Romanica's last two races, which were both at a mile, she has the best three races than anybody in this field. So like, I, I don't think Didia needs to improve that much. And Oh, by the way, why wouldn't she just be the same as she was coming off the layoff too? So I like, I, yeah, I'm I'm out on the six. I think the price is going to be too short, and I don't love the distance. Um, we'll see what happens. We'll we'll see what happens with her, but I I, I can at three to one. That's fair. You brought up great points. Uh, you do have two more, uh, and one of them I had considered if I wasn't going to single, uh, I was going to use the five English Rose just to her inside. Talk to me about the Appleby shipper. Yeah, look, it's Appleby, it's Buick, it's on the turf. Uh, do I need to say anything else? <laughs> this is the <laughs> four-year-old that, that is bred just phenomenally, right? So it's it's Franco, who now stands for $445,000, by the way. <laughs> I didn't uh, notice everyone, that until now. <laughs> everyone who's talking shit about uh, Into Mischief at 250 tack on another couple hundred grand, and then you can breed to Franco right now. And if you're going to do it, you might as well do it out of a DeBowie mare, right? Because he's like, what's what's the Bowie now? He's like 300000 to stand, so this is... One of the more expensive combinations you could possibly have in European racing. Uh, coming over here, we saw a wonderful run in Maidan where this horse won a Group 2. If you go back to the Group 2 prior to that, ran really well first off the layoff. Uh, was able to win a stakes race uh, in November of 2023 as well. So you've got a horse that is 3 for 4 lifetime, misses by, missed being a career 4 for 4 by a neck, that Appleby is bringing over and Buick is riding, by the way. Uh, Appleby is five for eight with these horses <laughs> coming over in the last last couple of years. Pretty good. Uh, you're getting nine to two, and this is a horse that ha that has just a world of upside and is bred so regally. I, I think it's hard to not include the five on your tickets here. For me, it's uh, I mean, along with you know singling Gina Romantica, I think English Rose needs a little bit more. She needs to continue progressing to be right there with your top horses, your your Gina's, your Surge Capacities, your Didia's. Uh, not saying she can't do it, but. Um, it, I saw Nick Siever says Buick coming makes it an auto use. 
at 0 for 2 with Appleby at Keeneland uh, in the last year. So Buick, not always a, an, an auto use here. It, is, uh, it hasn't worked out for them. But this Philly's got a lot of potential, a lot of times. I think that we'll see her back in America, hopefully, um, maybe in the fall, get maybe Breeders' Cup. I would love to see her run the Breeders' Cup there. Uh, World of Upside 4, just the way my ticket structure, Gina Romantica, is a single. But like I said, English Rose is my number two horse in this race. Yeah, uh, third on for me, because we've talked about this race for a lot longer than I expected. Actually, I thought we were going to talk about this race for a while because of your terrible pick of Gina Romantica on top. Uh, third third on the ticket for me here. Let's go to the rail. Let's go to the one-horse walkathon. Uh, I think that's what this horse could try and do. Make this a walkathon and just walk him around the mile of 16th over the turf course here. Uh, Leperu, one of those jockeys where you know there's a lot of love. There's a lot of hate, probably more hate than love for him. But one thing Leperu can do is absolutely rock him to sleep on the front end. We've seen it multiple times. You got to think that the world that, that like Wilkes is just like, just go, just go with walkathon. Don't even mess around. You're at the <laughs> rail. You're going to mile 16th. Go right to the front. Um, and we'll see if we can hold on. And it's funny because Rodney's like that horse won't hit the board. You know what? You might be right. She may not hit the board, but she may win, too. Like, that's the thing. This mm -hmm. is not a horse I would include underneath in the tries. Uh, but this is 100% a horse that I think is worthwhile including in pick fours or pick fives, especially if you're going three, four deep in this spot. Because let's say we're wrong and Serge Chapassi doesn't go. Or let's say Joel Rosario somehow makes a mistake on a horse that's supposed to go to the front end. Walkathon's alone out there. And then all of a sudden, you don't need to be the most talented horse in the race to be able to win going gate to wire. So uh, I'm going one, five, nine to get me through this leg. Walkathon for you here is Brigadier General for me in the last race. If it sets up perfectly, that horse is at a great use at 10 to 1. It's worth a gamble. But you also, I'm not saying put Brigadier General in second or third. Like that horse either wins or he's like, you know, still in the far term and the second to last horse is crossing the wire. So um, I'm without. Now, what are the odds? So there's four Chad Brown horses. He's got 40% of the field in here. Would you rate his chances at winning this race 40%? I mean, it's, it's nuts that he's just. Got all these horses to, for this race. Uh, I say he has about a so fluffy socks has a zero percent chance to win, so that's easy. <laughs> but we'll hit the board. That's the opposite of the other horses we're talking. <laughs> yes, about. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Gina Romanica has about a fifteen to twenty percent chance to win. Surge capacity, I probably say is ten to fifteen, and uh, Butte Cash Cache uh, is probably about five percent. 4%, somewhere in that range. So I'll say he's got a 33% chance to win the race. That's the other, other, other Brown with Frankie DeTori aboard. That's the one you got to watch out for. I mean, you, you, aren't you more worried about the 10 than the 2? As someone who used fluffy socks in her last two races, yes. Yes, I yeah. am. I'm learning my lesson. Shadi yeah, told me she's going to stage an intervention if I use fluffy socks again in this race. Honestly, if I picked, like, if I had to use the Browns in order of what order I'd use them, with price coming into effect, I would be 7, 10, 6, 2. Of what order they would make the ticket for winning, yes, yeah, for no, winning I'm the race, general. considering price in these things seven, ten, <laughs> six, two for the Browns. I would rather have the other, other, other Brown than the favorite Brown. Listen, just like uh, just like Jared last weekend, I'm really feeling some Gina uh, at Keeneland. Race 10 is the penultimate leg at Keeneland on Saturday, April 13th. That's the grade three Stone Street Lexington Stakes, the absolute final prep race for the Kentucky Derby. 10 three-year-olds entered to go a mile and the 16th on the dirt. Who's your top pick? Oh, I went with Encino. Um, and I don't love it because of the the, the style I'm expecting here. <laughs> uh, like, look, if I was picking Encino last weekend, how am I not picking Encino this weekend against a significantly worse field? Like, that, it's pretty much that simple to break it down. Uh, I did not want to do single. Uh, it's, I, what? No, no, I'm I'm with you. I didn't want to. Okay, I didn't know if you wanted to pronounce that down there. Um, <laughs> uh, Not live I, on uh, here. No. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, look, yeah, look. If I was going to pick Encino last weekend against that field, I'm picking Encino this weekend against this field. Uh, I didn't single because I I have a horse that's coming back in this race that I kind of really like, so I kind of felt I had to use that horse as well. Um, but I'm 100 percent against Hades. I, I think that you know, like liberal arts, a little interesting, but the price is completely off kilter and. Encino should be a shorter price than Liberal. It's not sure why that is there. I think Encino should be a shorter price than Hades. Uh, eat too. So this is this was the one where I thought it was a little funky on the morning line to me. But yeah, Encino on top for me. Uh, as long as this is not a speed favoring track, I think he gets the job done. Yep, I'm with you. And this is if I was going to have two singles, this would have been the other one here. But uh, we both liked him for the uh, for 
I almost said Risen Star for the Bluegrass Stakes last out. He's got a better post and a much easier field to be facing here. Uh, as a reminder, this horse is by a Kentucky Derby winner out of a Bernardini mare who's a half to another Kentucky Derby winner. So there's dirt all throughout the pedigree, even though he's never touched synthetic. And I love the versatility, right? He can win on the lead. He can win from well off of the pace. So depending on what he needs to do, I think his biggest knock is that last weekend we were going to have Flavian Pratt, and this week we've got Florent Giroux. So we've just got to pray that Giroux doesn't uh, mess things up for Encino, but we like him there. We each went too deep. I'm going to go all the way to the number 10, Lucky Jeremy, for my other pick. This is uh, just based off of if the track is speed favoring for two turns, I think this horse is absolutely going to be in the mix early. Corrales, will, uh, as long as he breaks from the gate well, which he usually does, Corrales will have him up front. The breeding says he's got the stamina to run all day long. The fact that he lost his stronghold in this uh, Sunland Derby looks better now that stronghold came back and won the Sandy the Derby. So I'm going to use Lucky Jeremy. I love the eight to one price here uh, for trainer Billy Mori. Yeah, I don't hate it. Uh, fourth horse on the ticket for me. I didn't end up using it. Or fourth horse in the race for me. I didn't end up using it. Uh, the post is a little questionable. We'll see. I mean, because Hades has got to go, right? Like Hades is 100% sending. So all of a sudden, Lucky Jeremy yeah. probably doesn't make the lead. And that was one of the big knocks for me. If Lucky Jeremy drew the one, I'm probably using the horse. But because he drew the 10, I think it's it's a little more difficult to, to kind of uh, envision the trip where he's able to get the job done here. Um, I went too deep here, and I used the two wine steward. And the wine steward has been a horse that I have been excited for this one to come back ever since we saw it run second to locked uh, at, in the Breeders' Futurity. I thought the horse actually ran a really good race that day. Um, locked obviously ends up running well in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Uh, we have the funny side. This horse won at Saratoga over El Grande O. El Grande O, for whatever you want to say, is at least a legitimate horse in this class. Um, and so the wine steward has been facing significantly better here. I, I, if he runs back to what he was able to do, like if he, let's say he goes back to the two-year-old or two-year-old form and improves by 5%. He's going to be really tough in this race. And, and so mm. I felt like I almost had to use the two, the wine steward. And it's the reason I'm not singling the eight. I'm against him because of the price combined with the layoff. But I absolutely understand anybody who wants to use him here. You've got to love that Saez is riding again. This will be his third time aboard the horse. I had a, way, or a half length away from being two for two. Um, I just don't know what wine steward we're going to see, and, and I don't know how he's going to handle the long layoff. I also, this is more of a personal thing. I don't love horses that are so great early in their two-year-old season. And I remember I watched live when he broke his maiden at Belmont. He was super sharp early in his two-year-old year. But then so many of those horses, Mike, you fast forward 12 months, like we're doing 11 months, like we're doing now. It's like, they don't take a step forward. Like they're, they're just what they were and Everybody else is going to pass them by. So I'm going to take a shot against him, but I am absolutely worried about the number two, the wine steward. Beat him here. Like Aaron said in the chat, he will win if he comes back well. Yeah, I mean, my, my, my counter to that is like, this is a, a May debut. And I agree with you. May debuts, I'm usually not that into because generally that means you're rushing into stakes races to get bold face type. Like you're not really de debuting a Kentucky Derby winner a year before the Kentucky Derby all that often. Um, but man, like, if he like he the way that he progressed through that two year old season where he got better and better and better in each of his starts throughout the process, man, if he's able to come back, I, I think he's going to be very dangerous here. And yes, he may not come back, but I, I, like if he doesn't come back, I think Encino should be eight to five in this race. And so mm -hmm. for me, it's really a simple thing of I'm going to use one or the other. I'm not going to single either of them because I have a major concern about the wine steward. But if I if like if I'm being honest. If Encino and the Wine Steward both ran their best race on Saturday, the Wine Steward is going to beat them. I don't know if I'm going to get the best race from the Wine Steward, though. That, to me, is the big question. Uh, Ed Burke was asking, is Hades the only one who makes the Derby with the win? Hades absolutely makes the Derby with the win. Encino, if he wins, when he wins, is going to be 21st. And we expect at least a couple defections. So he's all but in. And I believe Liberal Arts is going to be right on the fringe if he wins because he has points from the Southwest. He has points for winning the street sense, and he has some points from the Iroquois. He doesn't have that many points because they were earlier uh, preps, and a lot of those two-year-old ones don't give out much. But that's uh, that's how that one would shake out. I did see um, someone bringing up the four footprint. Watch out, Kenny McPeak, ten to one with Hernandez aboard. I'm gonna. I don't, like I say, I would be surprised if he won. I'm going to be very pissed off if he wins because I won't. I can't look at any race on his page and say that's the one that does it unless you look back at his maiden debut last October over this track in this distance. Fair enough. But 
And nothing he's done since then tells me he's a threat to win this race. He could hit the board, but not to win, Mike. If Encino or the Wine Stewart doesn't win this race, no one would surprise me. Like, it, That's honestly, a great because, point. <laughs> uh, like, yeah, the, well, what if the three is really good? And that, that maiden special weight win at Gulfstream takes a step forward off that, and all of a sudden he's good. What if Hades decides to go gate to wire and speed favoring? What I mean, maybe ever do it. I'd be surprised if ever do it one. What if Lucky Jeremy go, go, goes gate to wire? What if Liberal always puts it together and doesn't have any trip trouble? Like, there are two horses I think are legitimate horses in this race, and then there's a, eight horses who oh. could probably win if those two don't run a very good race. And so for me, it, it's like I, I knew I was going too deep pretty much from the jump on this one because what else are you going to – like, if, if I'm not too deep, I'm – eight deep i'm hitting the all button i'm not doing that in this spot if my aunt had wheels she'd be a bicycle fifth and final leg of the keeneland late pick five on saturday april 13th uh race 11 it's an n1x allowance for 12 i gotta make sure i get this all on screen 12 three-year-old males plus four also eligible that means we're going on the turf a mile and the 16th routing around where'd you go on top yeah we're both going deep here uh we're both yep. spreading like uh spreading like some peanut butter mm -hmm. uh give me the nine moonlight on top uh, I love these horses. I'm a sucker for these type of horses. When they debut a horse on turf and the horse runs, we'll call it reasonably well, ends up running second. And they try and put the horse back on turf. And the race gets rained off the turf. And then all of a sudden they think they have a dirt horse. When they get back to turf, I'm awfully interested. Because it was a turf horse the whole time, right? If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, don't tell me it's a, it's a, it's a dirt horse. And that's what we got here, right? This horse wants turf. We're getting back to the best surface. Uh, the four to one, I think probably a little bit of a pipe dream on the price, uh, but we got Derby fever and I get it, but running in back to back to back graded stakes for Derby points, probably not the best thing for Moonlight's career. I'm glad we're getting back to turf. I think this horse wants the turf. Uh, I think the nine is, is easily the topic in this spot. If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably Barbara Road. Happy retirement to Shadi's favorite horse. I, I use this horse, not my top pick here, uh, second up, but I, all of the reasons you said first time lane six, I think is a fun angle here. The works are pretty good. And uh, that turf try uh, got second in the neck to Carson's run. And that horse was, uh, you know, he is frustrating to play at times, but a talented horse. It was two and a half lengths clear of third. That's always like if you get second, but you are well beating everybody else in that field. That always, that to me, that's like a second with a plus next to it there. So uh, I'm with you there. Uh, top pick for me, number four, Deadpan. And I did go around, like I have a few different horses I thought about putting on top. I ended up landing on Deadpan at six to one. Broke the maiden over the course and distance here last October. Best career buyer came using Lasix two races back. That race got in 78 buyer. That's good enough to win here. The only horse with a better buyer on turf is the 10. Uh, and that horse did it breaking the maiden. And that was a long time ago. Horse gets back on Lasix here. And I love this angle. You talked about with the moonlight, an angle you love. First time gelding. He's more aerodynamic, baby. Less weight to carry around. Less things knocking around, slowing him down. Love deadpan. The number four horse at six to one. I loved everything about Deadpan except Joel Rosario. <laughs> I still end up using the horse. I like. <laughs> I I almost I'm you know before I was like you know Rosario is a good jockey, but I can't trust him. I almost find him unbettable right now at Keeneland. He did win a race today on the front end. Congratulations, Joel. Uh, but Just don't I, fall off, Joel. Just don't fall off. <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, but yeah, I, I use the four as well. You mentioned the LASIK side of it. I think that's important. You mentioned the gelding. I think that's important. Um, ran into First World War last time, the best horse in training in North America. So you can't really blame him for not being able to win in that race. Uh, so look, yeah, I like the four. I don't love the four. I don't love the fact that I like the four because it's Rosario, but at least it's six to one. Uh, I, I do think we're going to see a better price or a better improvement off the layoff. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, Dr. Miranda, glad you were able to join us in the chat here. I'm going to use Dr. Miranda's favorite jockey and go to the one, Pure Poetry and Florent Giroux. Favorite Giroud. trainer, too. Yeah, she loves favorite Brad trainer. Cox as well. So I you know, I, I had to pick this horse since Miranda's in the chat. Uh, I think we're going to see this horse go right to the lead. And again, drew the one post, went gate to wire, breaking the maiden last time out. The three has some speed, but that was all dirt speed. We haven't seen the horse try the turf yet. I'm not sure where we're going to get there. Also didn't make the lead, was sitting right behind horses in other races. After that, it's the eight horse, uh, who again, not really all that fast. We're talking like 48 halves. I think the yeah. one's able to get the lead and get it rather easily here. And in these races where you can have a bunch of horses, you can have different trip troubles. I think the one's really dangerous on the inside with the rail. Uh, also use this horse. Yeah, we agreed on uh, three horses in this race. And this, this we got here. Uh, th by the way, the third place finisher from Pure Poetry's Maiden Win Last Out. The horse's name is Night Out. One next out set his own career high buyer that actually matched what Pure Poetry got. 
for breaking his mate. And so a good comeback effort from that horse. Uh, this is where we're going to diverge a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, I'm going to go with the number five Royal Majesty at, at nine to two here for Bill Mott, Junior Alvarado. Broke Maiden in the debut for the Mott Barn uh, back in January at Gulfstream Park during the championship meet. Had plenty of pace to chase, and that was the key there. Last time out in the Colonel Liam, absolutely no pace. 25 and 254. The horse is like, what? how the hell am I supposed to close? Past horses that were tiring, but really didn't get any kind of ground gained on the top horses there. If there is a good pace set up here, if we do see the one go, the eight, if the eight decides with Gaffley on the board to go a little bit, maybe somebody else shoots out and, and tries to make it fast. If there's enough pace here, I think the five is very dangerous. That is just a big question mark. And I can understand if in your position, you're like, I don't, I don't think there's enough pace here for Royal Majesty to come from off the pace here to get the win. That was exactly why I didn't use the horse. I, I just, I didn't see enough pace for, for Royal Majesty to be able to chase him down in the lane. Um, and, and I, I like Mott. I like Alvarado. They've been actually doing very well at Keeneland so far. Uh, I just, uh, the pace to me was what the issue was here. This is the slowest horse in the field. You're going to be last to 12. You're going to have to be able to find a trip through all of it. Has a closing kick. I just, I don't think it's going to be able to get there in the end. I am going to use a bomb. And I know Rodney over here wanting to know if it's the, the eight or the 11. I don't like the eight. I considered the 11 frontline warrior. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, I couldn't quite get there with frontline warrior simply because I don't know what race he's run wins it. Uh, he'd have to take a nice step forward off that Keeneland uh, maiden special weight victory, but at least has a win over the course. I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with the seven here, and I'm gonna go with uh, Brittany Russell and Luis Saez who takes them out. If you look through the past performances, one of the three horses is Takayo, uh, or one of the key horses is Takayo, who's faced a bunch of these horses. Last time, Massif, the seven horse, just missed to Takayo. And that kind of gives me the or makes me feel like this is horse actually fits with this group. Now, we need to take a big time step forward. I get that first off the layoff here. But Brittany Russell's not shipping a horse to Keeneland just to ship a horse to Keeneland. She's a 26 percent trainer. When she ships, you got to pay attention, especially when she gets size aboard 33 uh, percent together in six efforts. The horse also picks up Lasix for the first time, carries 118, which is a low weight this horse has ever carried before. I realize the pace is an issue. That's that to me is the one question is how close can we be to the pace? If you look at the race where the horse broke her maiden uh, back at uh, in at Colonial Downs was only two lengths off of 48 pace. There is some speed here. Saez needs to get some of that speed out of Massif if he's going to be if she's going if he's going to be able to win this. I don't hate that 17 to one price, though. And the fact that Russell's shipping into Keeneland Saez is taking them out. We get first time Lasix and that that last race where Takaya or Tokayo, yeah, Tokayo, uh, one tells me that he fits if he's able to step forward. So I'm going to take the seven of 15 to one as the last horse. Respect all the arguments you made. I love the pickup of Saez. I cannot take a horse that's only run on Laurel or Colonial Downs turf and hasn't run since November in this spot. But you're getting a great price, so I'm not going to try and talk you off of it. And again, big, I mean, no shot at, uh, at, at Brittany's husband, Sheldon, or Javian Toledo, the other jockey that she loves to use. But uh, Sai is a huge, huge upgrade. Despite what Robin in the chat will tell you, it's a huge upgrade to Louise Sai. I can't believe the Louise Sai is slander from that guy. Look, um, look, talk, 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 air recruit, wine collector, Takayo, the last four races. It took till now to make you bring up Talk Talk. I'm very surprised. I thought for sure you're going to say, you look four back, loses to a great horse in Talk Talk, and I was going to hurt my eyes from rolling them too much. <laughs> I, I saved it till the end, just for you. Hey, I appreciate that. Last horse on for me, someone brought it up. I, just taking a flyer here, my own 15 to one shot. I'm gonna go with the number three incinerator. Um, this is the last horse on the ticket for me, but two reasons I like the horse here. We're trying turf for the first time. Uh, that's a 23% angle for trainer Arnie Delacour. Adds blinkers, that's a 31% uh move, just blinkers on 38% first time blinkers for the Delacour barn. So very high percentage moves. And the horse is by Flame Away, who was very talented on turf, was a stakes winner on turf. Actually, it was a stakes winner on all three surfaces, I believe. Uh, but just the combination of everything, taking a shot here, I, I, I like the price. At 15 to 1, I went back and forth. I was like, you know what? I can throw afford to throw Incinerator on here. If I left it off, 16 to 1, or it's a $64 ticket, but it's going to be $80 for me. I'm laughing because of uh, Aaron's comment there. Yeah. <laughs> very mature, uh, Aaron. What, what about the six? Uh, Gorilla Trek. Fun name uh, for trainer Phil Bauer, who is very, very strong at Keeneland. You got to watch out for this guy. He's already got two wins on the meet so far from eight starters. But uh, with Le Peru aboard, they were they teamed up for the maiden debut win, going two turns at Churchill Downs on the turf. 
any interest at all. I I don't see anything in a long while that makes this horse interesting. If there was some pace, I wouldn't hate it. Um, and so if you if you project that there's some pace in the race, I think using the the six gorilla trek at a price is worthwhile. And like this goes back to what we talked about, right? Broke breaks its maiden career debut going a mile sixteenth on the turf, then runs a mile sixteenth at Keeneland and finishes three lengths behind Can Group. Noted vote no, decent turf horses back at that time. Hasn't touched the turf since. Three rainoffs in a synthetic race. So you could make an argument that getting back on the turf is is the big difference here. So uh, Gorilla Trek 20 to 1, I wouldn't talk you off, um, assuming that you believe there's going to be some pace in the race. And uh, looking at the four also eligibles, J.D. Fox brings up the 16 Tiffery. So we're going to need four scratches to get this horse in. But if he makes it in, uh, that Kentucky Downs win going a mile. It was a very impressive. I remember that one on almost four lengths there. Beat Frontline Warrior, who's back in this spot. The 11, who Rodney loves. So, Rodney, if you like the 11, you've got to like the 16 as well. 16's not getting in, right? No, not no. getting in. But yeah. but definitely one to watch. And I'd be curious to too, see, too, like if if the 7 stays in and the 16 somehow makes it, which horse does Saez go with? That's Yeah, I wish they published first uh, first looks. They do on the overnights. I'm going to look at it real. It's for the 13th. I'm going to see if I can find it real quick here. Uh, race 11. Ba -ba -da -ba -da. Saez, first call on Tiffery, the 16. There you go. Yeah, I'm not shocked. Not going to get in, but not shocked. Not shocked. It's Shadwell. It's Brendan Walsh. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for this late pick five at Keeneland Action for Saturday, April 13th. So happy you were able to join us here. Uh, we got to get out of here because coming up in just a couple minutes is going to be Dudes Who Bet Sports uh, with Aaron and Papa Dude. But real quick, we'll give out our tickets for the visual listeners. Take a look down below. For the audio listeners, we're going to read them off for you right now. I'm going to start. I'm going to go 1, 5, 11, 12 with 2, 4, 5, 7, with 6, with 8, 10, with 1, 3, 4, 5, 9, 80 dollars. Mr. Samich. I'm going to play a little bit cheaper of a ticket. I'm going to go $72. I'll play the 7811 with 27 with 159 with 28 with 1479. 72 bucks for 50 cents. Over at racenews.com, the Lexington Stakes Betting Bible, the final one before the Kentucky Derby Betting Bible. The pre sales on right now. I'd assume that this is going to come out either late tonight, Thursday, or probably Friday morning is more likely. Uh, but remember, you can get that on its own for $40. If you get any premium subscription, so Aaron's premium products, the Rockets, or the Semo Bombs, any monthly subscription will get you all Bibles within that subscription period included with your purchase. So if you want to get this and you want to get the Kentucky Derby betting Bible, just sign up for a product. It's literally going to save you 20 bucks on that, and then you will get the benefits of whichever thing you decide to pick. If it's the Samo Bombs, if it's the Racing Dudes Picks, the Racing Dudes Rockets, it's all included right there. We've got previews up right now for the Makers Mark Mound, the Limestone. No idea if they'll be on the turf for those on Friday. And then also the Apple Blossom on Saturday at Oaklawn Park. If you wondered, why isn't Flavian Pratt named on any of the horses these guys are using? It's because he is over there riding wet paint in the Apple Blossom at Oaklawn Park. Mike, we got to get out of here, but any final thoughts before we do? Uh, Shadi is right. It's going to be hard to Franken ticket. Up. <laughs> it's going to be expensive are, to Franken ticket. We are very different. Like our top picks <laughs> not even used in the first race and the third race. So it will be, uh, it will be quite difficult to Franken ticket us. Um, but good luck with that Shadi. You worked last week. I hope it works for you again. Uh, don't add surge capacity though. That's not, I guess unless <laughs> you're Franken ticketing with, uh, Chris there, Chris Paiello. Anywho, you know, not too much to add here. Uh, excited about the masters I'm looking forward to watching that. Uh, they did teed off today been fun to watch that been a nice little distractions we go and the keelan's fun man i'm still excited about keelan we're a week into the meet that's a positive sign usually like every now and then you get like really excited and then it kind of just dwindles pretty quickly i'm still excited about keelan it's been fun to play it every day uh, i'm sure we're probably going to take off monday show we'll be back next thursday and we're absolutely going back to keelan because i'm with mike i love it it's a fun handicapping puzzle it's a beautiful track beautiful facility so even if you're losing your ass it still looks pretty right you enjoy the visuals uh, make sure you follow us on Twitter. I'm at Curtis Kellowart. He's at Subo Bomb 18, number one, number eight. Corporate overlords who are about to get teed off with us right now if we don't get out of here. They're at Racing underscore Dudes. Until next Thursday when we'll be back for more Keeneland fun. I'm Magic. And I'm Mike. See if I hit the right button. Good luck this weekend. The Magic Mike Show. Where you hear the experts speak. The Magic Mike Show. Tune into the show every week. The Magic Mike Show. You can trust the show is the bomb because it's being brought to you by RacingDudes.com.